So the Pasha begins, Hashem spoke to Moshe on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you, the land shall observe a Shabbos rest for Hashem. And it continues to the Shabbos rest for Hashem in the um, seventh year. This is called the Shemitah year, that there is a mitzvah that in Eretz Yisrael, in the land of Israel, that they could only work the work the land for six years. The seventh year is a Shabbos year for year, the same way that we have a six day week, work week, and the seventh day is Shabbos, where it's prohibited to do any work. So the land of Israel also, they had to observe that in years, that for six years they would work the land, and for the seventh year they were not allowed to work the land. But just, and I'll get back to this, but just the Parsha begins, Hashem spoke to Moshe on Mount Sinai. And then it follows with this mitzvah. And our sages ask, why is it um, specified that Hashem spoke to Moshe at Mount Sinai? All the mitzvahs, all the commandments were given to Hashem at Mount Sinai. So, the, um, so our sages answer that to tell us that just like this, this mitzvah, the mitzvah of Shemitah was given at Mount Sinai, not only in general, not only the um, the the idea, the basic idea, but the details were also given at Mount Sinai. So too by the um, by all the mitzvahs, th- it wasn't just the gen- the general idea that was given that was taught to Moshe on Mount Sinai. Rather, the entire all the details, all the halachas, all the laws together were given to Moshe on Mount Sinai. And the surface explanation for this is that back in Parshas Mishpatim, if you go back in um, Devarim in um, Shemos, the Parshas Mishpatim, there also. It talks about um, Shemitah very briefly. It just mentions it very briefly. So one may think that that's how it was taught at Mount Sinai. It was taught very briefly as just a um, general rule that um, you have to observe a sabbatical year and the details were left to figure out on our own. And that's why it's saying here specifically that this was taught at Mount Sinai. And just like this was, all the other misses were, well, even the details were taught at Mount Sinai. But they ask that why is it specifically Shemitah? Why specifically is it a sabbatical year? That's where this lesson is taught and not by anywhere, not anywhere else, by any other mitzvah, specifically Shemitah. So, um, um, Shimon Schwab answers that um, by other mitzvahs, someone could say that people made it up. They could say that it was a, hum- it was a human invention. And, um, you know, you can imagine someone coming up with the idea of Pesach, you know, like it's a nice holiday where the family sits together. It's all about family and parents teaching their children. And um, it's, um, you know, you, there's some restrictions, but in general, it's a very festive time. Sukkot is also a very festive time when it's a time of celebration. In some places, they have these parties where people are dancing all night. It's a beautiful thing, very celebratory. But Shemitah, nobody in their right mind would make up Shemitah. How could somebody tell people to take off, just, you know, take off a year of work? Every seven years, they'd have to take off a year of work. Nobody in their right mind would make that up. So it would only make sense that it would come from Hashem. And just like that mitzvah comes from Hashem, so all the mitzvahs come from God as well. And that's why it's specifically Shemitah where it chooses to say this. I'm sure we can relate right now. There are many people who are out of work right now who, um, you know, they're just losing the salary and it's very, very difficult for people. But, um, and this was true in the land of Israel, they had to take off an entire year every seven years, anybody who worked the land, that they wouldn't have their income for every, every seven years. And in fact, the Medrash, said, the Gemara says about them that there's a verse that talks about, um, I think it's Malachi Hasharis, the the heavenly angels, those who fulfill the will of God, and they say that it's referring specifically to these farmers who keep Shemitah, who observe the Shemitah, who follow, who um, observe this command, because it's such a difficult concept for people to um, be so, have such faith in God that God says, I don't work today, I don't work today. God says, I don't work this year, I don't work this year, that um, Hashem, that the prophet com- compares them to, to heavenly angels that they just, um, they um, sub, uh, what's the word? I don't know, subvert is not the word I'm looking to, but they, um, they, they lower themselves before Hashem 
in order to allow um, just whatever God says goes in spite of whatever feelings I have. Um, another answer given to Moshe Feinstein says something similar, and that is that um, when we fulfill the mitzvahs in the Torah, there are really two approaches one could take, even for an observant Jew, someone who observes the commandments, they could take the approach to always try to understand every mitzvah. What's the reasoning behind it? And fulfill it because of that reasoning. They understand the um, ideas behind every, every mitzvah. That makes sense. You know, they, they want to know why does the Torah commandment, command this when they hear it? Oh, that's so meaningful, I'm going to do this. When something's not meaningful, they find it very difficult. When they don't understand the meaning behind the mitzvah, they find it much more difficult to fulfill it. And, um, but the best way to fulfill the mitzvahs is purely a function of this is what God commands. God commands we, we do the following, so I do it. It's nice to know a reason that adds some flavor to the mitzvah, but ultimately the reason why we're performing it is that that's the will of God. God revealed it in the Torah that that's what, that's what we should do. So that's why we do it. Any, anything more than that, any other um, explanations or meaning, it just adds flavor to the mitzvah. But we're doing it in addition to that. We're doing it because that's what God commands. And that's the ultimate performance of the mitzvah. And that Shemitah is the ultimate example of that. That no one, once again, no, no, nobody in the right mind can give a reason for Shemitah. How can you, how can you, um, how can you just give up your salary for an entire year? How can you give up the produce of the land for an entire year? And even though people do let land lie fallow, but usually what they'll do is they have multiple parcels of land, they'll rotate it. So they're, at least they're getting something this year. But to completely leave everything tallow, it would destroy an entire economy. If nothing, if the entire country isn't producing, so that could destroy an economy. Mm -hmm. Only God could promise, like we'll see, that they'll be okay. And um, that's the ultimate where we follow it because it's God's command, not because we appreciate the reasoning behind it. And Ramosha Feinstein adds in that um, this could be, this whole idea of following the mitzvah, the importance of doing the mitzvah because it's what God commands, not because of any reasons, could be illustrated by um, our, the, our forefather, Avraham Avinu, our forefather, Avraham, that our sages say, and it's, it's pretty clear in the Torah, that he had many followers. He was someone who brought many people close to the Torah. He taught about, um, he taught about the oneness of God. He taught about God. And he had followers, but we don't have, we don't know, we, there's no legacy to that. We don't, we don't find anything in the next generation. In the next generation, you don't see anything about any followers of Abraham that they stayed close to God. We have the Jewish people, and that's really it. You don't have a segment of people that are descendants of the followers of Abraham who um, follow the oneness of God because of that. And he says the reason for that is, is that Abraham and his followers as well were not commanded to do anything. There were no mitzvahs at the time. So any Torah that Abraham learned or any Torah that he taught was only based on his own understanding of, um, of the world. It was based, he, had a, he was extremely sensitive, spiritually sensitive, and he was able to look at the world and understand this is the way things work, and this is the right thing to do. This, is, this, this thing would be spiritually effective. So he ate matzah on Pesach because he was sensitive and understood that spiritually, this is a, a very spiritually effective thing to do is eat matzah on Pesach, and it's the right thing to do spiritually. But since he wasn't so, and he had followers who followed him, but since they weren't doing it because they were commanded, because they weren't commanded. They were just doing it because they understood that it's, that it's good. So that's the, kind of thing, that's the kind of thinking that doesn't pass on to the next generation. That you can't pass on the next generation that this is what we should do because it's right, because they might have different definitions of right. And really the only way to pass on the next generation is that this is the will of God, and so that's what we have to do. And Avram couldn't teach that because it wasn't commanded by God yet. Okay. The Ramban, says a different explanation of why the, it's introduced, why the Parsha is introduced, that it was at Mount Sinai. And he says, because we had this mitzvah already in Parsha's Mishpat, and we were already commanded in the mitzvah of Shemitah. But um, that came before, the, um, before Moshe broke the luchas. So what happened is, we, the mitzvahs were taught to Moshe at Mount Sinai in Parsha's Mishpatim, where, um, in fact, it mentions the 
um, the mitzvah shnita for the first time, in part in the, which is right after the, the give the Ten Commandments. So that may have even been taught, according to many commentaries, that was taught before the Ten Commandments, um, before we heard the Ten Commandments, we, we were taught Parshas Mishpatim. So we had already been taught about Shemitah before then. Then when Moshe broke the tablets, the first set of tablets, he saw the Jews um, worshiping or um, celebrating with the golden calf and he smashed the tablets. So at that point in time, they, um, at that point in time, that was a really a destruction of the covenant between us and Hashem. So here it's saying, so Moshe went up and, and Davin Tashem, he pled for um, a return to the, um, a return of the Torah, a return to being um, in this covenant with Hashem. And Hashem agreed and we got the new set of tablets on Yom Kippur. It was actually Moshe brought down the second set of tablets on Yom Kippur. Then the Torah interrupts with the giving of the, with, I'm sorry, with the mitzvah of the Mishkan, of the tab to build the tabernacle, which is um, showing the Jewish people that Hashem is still among us, even after our sin, Hashem is dwelling among us. Then come the mitzvahs of the, of the service in the Mishkan, the different offerings that we would, the different offerings we would bring in the, in the tabernacle, and how the Kohanim would have to act. And now we're getting back to those original teachings of those original mitzvahs that we were taught in Parshas Mishpatim, we're repeating them here to say that in spite of the fact that we sin, the mitzvahs are all the same. So we're saying that he taught this at Mount Sinai, meaning he was taught a second time at Mount Sinai, that these are the mitzvahs that you do, those same mitzvahs that I taught you by the first covenant, you have the same mitzvahs now, when, after having gotten the second tablets, after the first one being broken, symbolizing the breaking of that covenant, the covenant was over. Now we have a second one with the new second tablets that these mitzvahs are still in place. And he says that's why in the next week, the next parsha, which is the second parsha this week, it's called Parsha Tzuchukosai. It gives a um, the it talks about the great things that we'll have, all the blessings we'll have if we follow the Torah and the terrible things that will, will happen to us if we don't follow the Torah. And that's illustrating that the same way that by the first commandments, we, it says that we, we received it with, a, with an oath and a curse, meaning an oath that we'll follow it and some bad things will happen if we don't follow it. So by the second covenant as well, we're concluding the second covenant with this oath and a curse that the bad things that will happen if we don't follow the Torah that we received, if we don't keep stay, keep to the covenant. Okay, so that's the first passage, the first verse in the parsha. So it continues in Shemitah. Um, I'll go to verse two. This is page six ninety seven. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land that I give you, the land shall observe a Shabbos rest for Hashem. For six years you may sow your field, that means plant, and for six years you may prune your vineyard and you may gather in its crop. But the seventh year shall be a complete rest for the land of Shabbos for Hashem. Your field shall not sow and your vineyard you shall not prune. You can't do any work to contribute to the growing of the crops. This is specifically in the land of Israel. I have to be clear with that. Um, in verse 5, the aftergrowth of your harvest you shall not reap, and the grapes you shall you, you have set aside for yourself, you shall not pick. It shall be a, land, a year of rest for the land. And the Shabbos produce of the land, meaning the stuff that grows without your work, without you working the land, some stuff will grow shall be yours to eat for you, for your slave, for your maidservant, for your laborer, and for your resident who will dwell with you, and for your animal, and for the beast that is in the land, it shall, be, shall all this crop be to eat, that it's, um, it's, um, oh, it's, the produce is as if it's ownerless, that anyone could come into the field and eat anything growing. So the owners, let's say someone owns, owns an orchard in the land of Israel, they would be able to eat from the fruits that grow, but anyone else could walk in and eat it as well. So um, it's somewhat onerless. They, they have actually a system where it's um, controlled by the courts. That you have the Jewish court, the religious, I should say, the ritual courts, not the secular courts in the land of Israel. But the religious courts actually have a system where you could buy through them. And they would pay the owner of the land a salary in order to maintain what he could maintain. And um, that way he does get something. And there's some, it's not, what we call a hefkevelt. It's not like completely chaos. But um, for the most part, um, for the, this is called the, the kupa, but for the most part, anyone could take from the, just walk into the field and take the stuff there. 
So in verse 8, you shall count for yourself seven cycles of sabbatical years, seven years, seven times. So each sabbatical year, each sabbatical cycle is seven years, six years of work. The seventh year, you leave the, all the fields fallow. Six years of work, the seventh year, no growing. No, we're no working towards growing. So now you do seven of those cycles, which is seven years, seven times, 49 days. The years of the seven cycles of the sabbatical year should be for you 49 years. You shall sound a br broken blast on the shofar in the seventh month, on the 10th of the month. On the day of atonement, you shall sound the shofar throughout your land. In verse 10, you shall sanctify the 50th year and proclaim freedom throughout the land for all its inhabitants. It shall be the jubilee year for you. Each of you shall return to his ancestral heritage, and each of you shall return to his family. Verse 11, on page 699, verse 11, it shall be a jubilee year for you, this 50th year. You shall not sow, you shall not harvest. It's aftergrowth, once again, similar to Shemitah, to the sabbatical year. This is the 50th year. So you have, in the 49th year, it's the sabbatical year, the 50th year. Now you have two years in a row of not harvesting. The 50th year as well, for, and in verse 12, for it will be as a jubilee year, it shall be holy to you. From the field you may, not eat, you may eat its crop in this jubilee year. Each of you shall return to his ancestral heritage. So there's a lot to parse here. The first thing is that on the 14th, it says, says you shall sound a, sound a broken shofar glass, says verse 9, on the shofar in the seventh month, on the tenth of the month. We tend to associate the shofar with Rosh Hashanah, the first of the seventh month, of the month of Tishrei. Here, they're blowing the shofar on Yom Kippur of um, on Yom Kippur of the of the Jubilee year, and I think it's who did I write this from? Um, and, um, I, I saw from someone that one of the reasons behind this is that um, the shofar is a symbol towards the, our receiving the Torah. That when we um, the Torah says that when we received the Torah, there was a shofar shofar blast that was um, continuous and very, very powerful shofar blast when we received the Torah. And if you look at the Musaf prayers of, of Rosh Hashanah, you'll see that there's a section of shofars, there's 10 verses that talk about the shofar, and most of them talk about the receiving of the Torah. And because, as I mentioned, we got the second set of tablets on Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur is really a day of us receiving the Torah. That's when we got the current luchos. The current covenant of the Torah we got on Yom Kippur, so it's a time of the blowing of the shofar. And um, just something I saw about this idea of the, the connection between the shofar and Torah is that um, a sound, which is the, what the shofar is all about, it's a, it's, this, it's a sound producing horn. So. Sound is an amazing thing. This is more of like a Kabbalistic view. Is that sound, with with sound you could have a thought in your own head and, or an idea in your head, and you could put it in someone else's mind. It's an incredible thing, the fact that that's how we communicate. We communicate through talking, through sound coming from our mouths to someone else's ears. We have a thought in our brain, and we could convey that to someone else's brain. Just by making sounds out of our mouth, it goes, they hear it with their ears and interpret it with their brains. Now they know the idea that we had. And um, it's almost, you know, now we have computers can do that. You can save information in one computer and you press send and it goes to another computer. It's an amazing thing. And we could do it just by opening our mouths and talking. That we move an idea from our minds to someone else's mind. And that's what the giving of the Torah was taking the thoughts of Hashem in a sense. It was communicating to the Jewish people, taking the thoughts of Hashem through which, through which Hashem created the world and transporting it to us, that now we have access to that. And that's represented by the shofar sound, by the sound of the shofar is the sound of a ideas coming from the spiritual realm, from Hashem, down to us. Okay. Um, and another thing they say is that, um, it says with the, you blow the shofar throughout the land and proclaim freedom throughout the land for all its inhabitants, that the shofar, the Torah, brings us freedom from the Yitzhahara, from our evil inclination. It's only through the Torah that we can be free from that, from the evil inclination. Okay. Um, other things about this Jubilee year. 
It says that you, you proclaim freedom in the land to all its inhabitants. What that means is that any Jewish slave would go free in the Yovel year. So there are two classes of slaves or bondsmen in the Torah. There's the Jewish bondsmen and the non-Jewish bondsmen. The usual way a Jew would become a slave, a bondsman, as they call him, is if, um, let's say he stole something and didn't have money to pay, so the court would sell him as a slave, and then they would take that money to, um, they would take that money and use it to pay up the loan. They didn't have a jail system necessarily, and instead of thief going to jail, he would have to work, and he would pretty much work off what he stole. There are also cases where someone became so impoverished that he couldn't support himself. And rather than be homeless or starving, he would sell himself as a servant. But once again, this is in the case of a Jew being sold to a Jew, he was not, he was only, and this actually comes back up later in the past, he was only a slave for six years. In the seventh year, he would go free. And there was an option, a way for him to become a slave longer. And if he decided on that, he would be a slave until the Yovel year. But if the Yovel year came in between, once again, he would go free. So whenever the Yovel year came, all Jewish bondsmen would go free. Additionally, it says, um, where am I? Where am I? In verse 13, oh, in verse 10, it also says, it shall be the Jubilee year for you. Each of you shall return to his ancestral heritage, and each of you shall return to his family. This means that in the land of Israel, all land that was sold, returns on the Jubilee year. That means that if somebody um, sold his property, he sold his house in the land of Israel, it would return to the owner, to the seller, every Jubilee year. So there was no such thing as a permanent sale of land in the land of Israel. All sale was really a long-term lease or even a short-term lease, depending on when the sale was and when the Jubilee year was. And as it says, a little later in the Parsha, they, everybody would have to take this into account when they sold land. They, have to, they would have to take into account how many years it is till the Jubilee year because that's how long the sale would be affected because it's really just a lease. And um, this is an illustration of an idea that the, land, that the land of Israel does not belong to any individual. Even a piece of the land of Israel doesn't belong to an individual. It belongs to God. This is the land, the, the land of Israel is the land of Hashem's. It belongs to Hashem, it doesn't belong to us. And Hashem apportioned it, split it up amongst the tribes, and each, the land of each tribe was split amongst each family. And the intention was that each family should be together. And that's something in Savannah I'm sure we could relate to with them. So it seems that everybody's family here and family lives together here. But, um, but really Hashem's intention was that families should be living in the same area. And since each family the land was split amongst each tribe. Each tribe split the, their land amongst each family. And it went back every Yovo, every Jubilee year, it went back to the original owners. As they inherited, the land would be split up more and more, but it would be split up amongst brothers. And those brothers would have a permanent ownership outside of any temporary leases. They would have a permanent ownership and their children would split up their land. So they'd have a permanent ownership outside of some leases that would, be, that would end. So really, families would end up living together because of this, which is a beautiful thing. Okay, and um, moving on a little bit. In verse 14, page 699, verse 14, it states, when you make a sale to your fellow or make a purchase from the hand of your fellow, do not buy from your fellow. Um, I'm sorry. Um, do not aggrieve one another. Aggrieve, do not oppress one another. And it continues in verse 15, according to the number of years after the Jubilee year shall you buy from your fellow, according to the number of crop years shall you sell it. According to the greater number of years shall you increase his price, according to the lesser number of years shall you decrease the price, for he is selling you the number of crops. So um, here the Torah is saying, do not oppress him. Our sages understand this to mean, do not overcharge someone and do not underpay somebody. Which means that, this is also very relevant now, that at a time where there are shortages in certain things, shortages in, um, in protective equipment, shortages in even um, toilet paper, then there are people selling things at tremendous markups just because they can. The stockpiling and selling at tremendous mark markups, the Torah is saying that it's prohibited to sell above market value, meaning you can mark things up based on what you bought it for, but you can't sell it. Like if you buy wholesale, obviously you could 
mark it up to sell at retail, but you can't sell something significantly above market value. And the halacha in the Torah, it, in the Gemara, the Gemara explains that if somebody sells something more than a sixth of its value, so you take one sixth of the value, if the markup is more than a sixth from what the market price is for that thing, what the going price is, so the, um, the buyer, or if, if the person underpays, the same goes for the buyer. If a buyer underpays more than a sixth of, of, its, going, of its going price in the market, so, um, either, so they could actually nullify the sale and get back the money. We, we, or, and um, I'm sorry, they would nullify the sale. If, if they marked up less than a sixth, they could re, be reimbursed for the amount of the market. So um, if someone sold something for more than the going price, so, um, they, so the, the buyer could go to the court and get that, the difference back. The stockpiling and, um, and price gouging is prohibited by the Torah. And why is this here? So the Ramban says one of two things. Either it's because we're talking about, um, we're talking about how they'd have to calculate how many years it is until Yovel to figure out the price of the land because the land was just a lease. It wasn't a, a permanent sale because it would go back on Yovel. It was a lease, to, a lease until Yovel. So someone might um, fudge the numbers a little bit and convince the person that it's actually less years to, or more years to Yovel than he thinks. So less years to Yovel than, than he thinks. It's just some people aren't so clear with that math. So um, he's telling him you can't be very, that's prohibited. And um, I think the Ramban says, that in addition, the Talmud says that these laws of, I know, these laws of overcharging and underpaying do not apply to land. That when it comes to real estate, when it comes to land or any, like a house, anything attached to the land, so then um, the laws, you can't nullify a sale because a person overcharged or underpaid because um, it's, it seems to be understood that land, the amounts are very clear. It's very um, easy to, It's very easy to figure out how much it's worth, and therefore, um, yes, yeah, very easy to figure out how much it's worth. Therefore, you can't nullify a sale based on this. But the Ramban is saying, the Torah is saying, even by land, even though you can't nullify, one couldn't nullify a sale because they overpaid or because they were over, because um, they under, because they were underpaid or because they overcharged. But um, it is prohibited by the Torah. It's, it's a prohibition in the Torah to do that. It's prohibited. Price gouging is prohibited by Torah law, even by land, in spite of the fact that they won't be able to get it back to court. Okay, so then it continues in verse 18. You shall perform my decrees, observe my ordinances, perform them, then shall you, then shall you dwell securely in the land. And um, I think the Ramban says this is also another connection the reason why this is all here is a connection between our Parsha and the Parshas that came before is that in Achrimos Kedoshim and to a lesser extent Emar, we had the laws of, um, of marital purity and of um, relationships that are prohibited, relationships that are permitted. And about those relationships, the Torah said that, um, that these relationships will allow you to dwell in the land because like we said, that the land vomited out the um, inhabitants because of their violations of these ideas, because of their immorality in their relationships, the land um, vomited them out. And the Torah is saying, follow these laws so you don't get vomited out of the land too. So, um, and here also when it comes to Shemitah, it comes to overcharging, there also the Torah is saying that this following these laws allow you to dwell securely in the land because if one doesn't follow these laws, so the, they can't be too secure in dwelling in the land because the land will not stand for that. Okay, now on page 701, we have a promise in the Torah. In verse 19, page 701, the land will give its fruit and you will eat your fill. You will dwell securely upon it. If you will say, what will we eat in the seventh year? Behold, we will not sow and not gather in our crops. I will ordain my blessing for you in the sixth year, and it will year yield a crop sufficient for the three-year period. You will sow in the eighth year, but you will eat from the old crop. Until the ninth year, until the arrival of the crop, you will eat the old. Okay, so now, um, 
the Torah is giving a promise. People might have a problem with this, that what are you going to eat in the, I mean, what will we eat in the seventh year? If we're observing the Shemitah or Abu, then there's a full year that we don't have crops. And if we're if in a Yovel year, there's two years in a row that we're not growing anything. What are we going to eat? So then Hashem's telling, telling him that I'll, I'll give you such a blessing in the sixth year that you'll eat the old crop all the way until you're growing new stuff again. It's a promise in the Torah that we will survive. Shemitah and Yovo. Okay? But, um, and some question that it begins in verse 19, the land will give its fruits, you'll eat your fill, you'll dwell securely upon it. Already said that the land will, um, will give its fruits, you'll eat your fill. Now it says, if you will ask what we'll eat in the seventh year, people are questioning God, then it says Hashem will grant our blessing. What if people don't question God? Will we not have that blessing? Is the questioning of God what grants the blessing? Meaning, it very well could have said that without the question, it just could have said that I will grant your ble my blessing so that you'll never, have not you'll never have nothing to eat because of your fulfillment of these mitzvahs. But it brings the question as if the question is the cause of God giving us this blessing. And um, the commentary say, Moshe Feinstein says that in fact, this blessing isn't so much a blessing that before it says in verse 19, the land will give its food, you will eat your fill. Then it says, if you, if you will say, if you'll question God and say, what will we eat in the seventh year? Behold, we will not sow and not gather in our crops. Verse 21, I will ordain my blessing for you and it will yield a crop sufficient for the three year period. Meaning you'll have lots of stuff. Lots of stuff will grow and that lots of stuff will be enough, will be sufficient for you to eat. And there's a concept by, um, the Meshach Chachma talks about it at length, that the, the ultimate blessing of Hashem is not a blessing of quantity. The ultimate blessing of Hashem is a blessing of quality. And um, it's true about everything, that um, the blessing of Hashem is better to have a little bit that goes a long way than a lot that goes just that far. And that's true about, in this case, it's true about produce as well. Before the question, in verse 19, it says, the land will give its fruit, you will eat your fill. Meaning that the land will give whatever it'll give, but it will last for you. It'll be enough. You'll be filled. It'll, uh, our, the Gemara uses an expression that it'll be misbarf b'meav. It'll be blessed in your, in your stomach. That it will be sufficient. You won't need to eat. The food will be so nutritious, so filling, that you won't need more to eat. Whereas, um, whereas once one questions God, what will we eat? How can we do this if we're questioning the mitzvah of God? So then we won't merit that blessing. We won't merit the blessing of quality, that the food will be, be of such quality that the, that the amount that we have will be sufficient for that time. Rather, we'll need the quantity. We'll need lots of food in order to be enough to fill us, in order to be sufficient for the people to be fed. And I think he comments that the question that they're asking is, if you'll see, what will we eat in the seventh year? That's the wrong question to ask. The seventh year is obvious what you'll eat. You'll eat the fruits of the sixth year because that's always how it works. The fruits that you, that you produce or the produce that one produces in one year are eaten the next year. They're not eaten while they're being grown. They're eaten the year after that you grow them. So why are they asking what will we eat in the seventh year? They should be asking what will we eat in the eighth year if we don't grow anything in the seventh year? And that was the, big, the biggest problem with this question is that they're asking at the wrong time. Rather than, he says that at a time, if a person's starving, it's very appropriate to, add, to pray to God and ask him, I have nothing to eat, what should I do? But if someone's not starving, if someone has all, everything they need and they're worried, they're asking, what will I eat tomorrow? That's demonstrating a lack of faith in Hashem. If someone doesn't have what they need, it's appropriate to ask. If someone does, has what they need, but they're worried about tomorrow, that's demonstrating they don't have faith in Hashem that'll give them what they need tomorrow. And that's how this question demonstrates a lack of faith. And therefore, if one asks this, what will I do later? Now I have everything I need. What will I do later when, I, when presumably I won't? That's the kind of question that they would lose this blessing of, um, of, of the, that the quality will be so great that they won't need great quantity. Okay, so now on page 701, verse 23, the land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine. 
And like we said, for you are sojourners and residents with me. Like we mentioned that it goes back to the sellers on Yovel, and any sale is just a, a lease. In 20, verse 24, in the entire land of your ancestral heritage, you shall provide redemption for the land. If your brother becomes impoverished and sells part of his ancestral heritage, his redeemer who is closest to him shall come and redeem his brother's sale. If a man has no redeemer but his means suffice and he acquired enough for his redemption, then he shall reckon the years of his sale and return the remainder to the man whom he had sold it, and he shall return to his ancestral heritage. But if he does not acquire sufficient means to repay him, then his sale shall remain in his possession of his purchaser until the jubilee year, and the jubilee year shall leave and return to his ancestral heritage. So here it's saying that um, after someone sells, a fit, sells their land, they have rights to buy it back. Once again, this is in the land of Israel. And um, one second. Yeah. So, um, and, and the commentaries explain that if someone buys a field, they have rights to it for full rights to it for two years. That means they have two, they have, they have to get the production of two years or else because the person goes through so much to buy land. If it could be, if the person, the person was, if the seller acquires their, you know, pulls together some money and able to buy it back. So someone went through all that work for nothing. So if someone sells a field, they're oh. able to buy it back for two years. I'm, I'm sorry, for two years, it has to stay in the hands of the buyer. After those two years, the seller could redeem it, or even a close relative of the seller can buy it back. So, um, and this is demonstrated in the book of Ruth, that um, when Ruth sold her field, so eventually, I'm sorry, when Naomi sold her field, eventually her relative, Boaz, bought it back and married Ruth, and through this union came, through this union came, um, Ovid, who is the father of Yishai, the, grandf the father of David. So through this union came the grandfather of King David. Okay. Another thing they point out here is that it says, um, where is this here? In verse 25, if your brother becomes impoverished and sells part of his ancestral heritage, and our sages say that, that's the Torah is telling us the only time that is appropriate to sell land in Israel to sell one's um, ancestral inheritance, that this is land that was given to the, their tribe, given to their family, and given to them specifically by God. Yeah. This is land that was allocated to the person by Hashem, and one should never sell that land. And the, really the only excuse is if one's impoverished, then one can sell their portion of land, their ancestral portion of land in the land of Israel. But otherwise, otherwise it should never be sold. Okay, so that's a regular case. So now in page 20, verse 29, still in page 701, if a man shall sell a residence house in a walled city, its redemption can take, take place until the end of the year of its sale. Its period of redemption shall be a year. But if it is not redeemed until its full year has elapsed, then the home that is in the city has a wall, that has a wall will pass in perpetuity to the one who purchased it for his generations. It shall not go out in the jubilee year. So now we see that, that so until now we we're talking about a field or a house in an open city, but a house in, in, in a walled city is considered holier in a sense than in other places. And that house, if it's sold, so they only have one year to redeem it. And after that year, um, it would stay by the owners until the Yovel, until the Jubilee year, when all land would go back to the original owners. Okay. And then um, in, on page 703, there's a law of the Levites. As for the cities of the Levites, the homes of the, in their cities of their ancestral heritage, the Levites shall have an eternal right of redemption. And what one buy from the Levites, a home that has been sold there in the city of its ancestral heritage, shall go out in the Jubilee year. For the homes of the Levite cities, that is their ancestral heritage amongst the children of Israel. So the Levites were not given territory like the rest of the tribes. They were given a, um, a discrete portion of land that, you know, like this, count, this big area and, you know, county or whatever you'd call it belongs to this tribe, the Levites were given 48 cities that were scattered throughout the land. So, the, um, and each, once again, each family had their own section. And what each Levite had, if he, if he was forced to sell it, so he would always be allowed to buy it back. And once again, it would come back to him in the land uh, and the, and during Yovo. And now on page 703, verse 35, if your brother becomes impoverished and his means falter in your proximity, you shall strengthen him. This is the mitzvah of tzedakah, the mitzvah of charity. If someone becomes, if your brother, your fellow Jew becomes impoverished, 
there's a mitzvah to help him out. How, whatever helping out means, giving money, giving him training to get a job to, um, you know, or even lending him money is a mitzvah to, that, to lend him money, do what you can to put him back on his feet so that he can live with you. In verse 36, do not take from him interest or an increase and you shall fear your God and let your brother live with you. Do not, in verse 37, do not give him your money for interest. Do not give your food for increase. I am Hashem, your God, who took you out of the land of Egypt to get to the land of Canaan to be a God unto you. So here it says really two things. In the law, we were not allowed to lend to a Jew with interest. This is one of those interesting cases. One can, is allowed to lend to a non-Jew with interest, but we cannot lend to Jew with interest. It uses two expressions, though, for interest. It says, do not give your money um, for interest and do not give your food for increase. The Hebrew there is atikach mitu neshach, one word for interest that uses neshach, besarbis and ribis. And um, that's in, actually, I, I got a little ahead of myself. That's in 35. Uh, maybe not. Oh yeah, that's in 36. Do not take from him interest and increase. These two things, what's interest and what's increase. So um, the, the Talmud talks about that if there's really a difference and it comes out that there isn't. The Ramban says though that the two words are hinting at two different ways of taking interest. <coughs> one is a monthly thing that one could lend money and every month the person has to give every, you know, a certain amount more and the longer the loan, the longer the loan, the more they'll have to give. So if they're paying 6%, so every month they have to give a certain amount more than, um, and it ends up that in the end they pay more than what they borrowed. And another way is that if someone borrows $100, the agreement is that when you pay up, you pay back in a month, you have to pay back 120. Because you're paying back a certain percentage more, not in little bites, that's the expression of, um, how do they say, interest. The Hebrew is neshep, which really means bites. It's saying not little bites, just biting off little by little, but like a credit card that it looks like a small amount, but every it adds up every month, it gets more and more and more. So that's prohibited. Not only is that prohibited, it's prohibited to have a specific amount where the person knows exactly what they're getting into. They're borrowing this amount, they're gonna to have to pay this amount. That's also prohibited. And Rav Shimon Schwab asks that this is an interesting case because why, what, what's, why, is, why, is, why is money different than anything else? that anything else, one is allowed to sell. Someone could sell their, um, sell their car and they're giving something of value and getting back money in, in exchange. Someone can even rent their car. They're giving something of value for an amount of time and they're getting back money in exchange. What, what, what is it about a loan that the Torah says we're not allowed to get back money and we're not allowed to get paid for that? And money has value, having money has value. It's very understood to anybody in finance. That, that having money is very valuable, having liquid assets is very valuable. So why is it that's prohibited to charge for that? So Rabbi Shimon Schwab says that the, and, and additionally, usually whatever we're not allowed to do to Jew, we're not allowed to do to a non-Jew. We're not allowed murders, we're not allowed to murder a Jew, we're not allowed to murder a non-Jew. And this is true about just about all the commandments. What we cannot do it to Jew, we cannot do it to a non-Jew. What is it about Ribis, about, taking interest that we are, we're not allowed to do to Jew, but we are allowed to do to non-Jew. Is it morally wrong or not? Why is it different when it comes to Jew and non-Jew? And um, he answers, or Shimon Schwab answers, that um, the answer is kind of clear in the verse, that it says in verse 36, um, it concludes, do not take from him interest and increase and you shall fill your God, your brother lived with you. And that, that's an important expression, let your brother live with you. And what it's saying is that we have to recognize that every Jew is our brother. We're all, one, we're really all one family. And while if a brother sells something to brother, you know, if you have two brothers, one selling a car to another, they would, it makes sense, it's not considered um, inappropriate to charge him for the car. You see, you're selling something, he takes it. But if a brother needs a loan, for a brother to charge his fellow, his brother interest, that would be cruel. That, that's considered, that, that's inappropriate. And it's something that's understood that if you're lending money to your brother, you're lending money to family, you don't charge for that. You don't, you don't charge him interest. That, that's something that's looked down upon. And, and to understand this mitzvah, we really have to recognize 
that we're all family, all Jews are family. And if somebody, if we have somebody who's needy amongst our family and he needs, he needs some cash flow to get put on his feet, so to charge him interest on that is wrong. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with charging interest and that's why we can do it to non-Jew. But since we're all family, that's why it's wrong to charge to our fellow Jew. Okay, so now in verse 39, the bottom of page 703, it gives some laws about our, um, about the Jewish slave and about how we have to um, treat him properly. We have to treat him very delicately and very, with kid gloves, we can't oppress him, we can't work him too hard. And then it has the laws of a non-Jewish slave. And um, then it has the laws of um, about a fellow Jew who gets sold to a non-Jew. I'll just read that page 705, verse 47. If the means of a sojourner who resides with you shall become sufficient, and your brother becomes impoverished with, with him and he has sold to an alien who resides with you, or to an idol, or to an idol of a sojourner's family, that if a Jew gets so poor that he sells himself to a non-Jew or even sells himself to a church, he sells himself to an idolatrous temple, after he has been sold, he shall have redemption. One of his brothers shall redeem him, his uncle, his cousin, a relative, so his family shall redeem him. But there's a mitzvah to be redeemed. It's a mitzvah on all relatives to redeem him if he's sold to a non Jew because well, he can't keep his <laughs> properly if he's not in control of his own destiny and his own actions. Okay? And in the, it, it concludes in um, 707, chapter 26. Um, you shall not make idols for yourself. Second, I can, uh, can you mute, mute everybody? Yeah, that's what I was going to do. Wait a second, I have to. And everybody who's not on the phone can unmute them. Everybody who's not calling in can unmute themselves to ask any questions. I think I left it open. Okay, and it concludes chapter 26, verse 1. You shall not make idols for yourself. You shall not erect for yourself a statue or a pillar. And in your land, you shall not emplace a flooring stone upon which to prostrate your oneself. For I am Hashem, your God. My Shabbos shall you observe, and my sanctuary shall you revere. I am Hashem. That's how this parsha ends. The next parsha we read this week is Parsha's Bechukosa. Just a quick overview. We usually read, through, and when we read it in the show, it's read quickly, so I'll give a quick overview of the parsha and maybe a few comments. On page 709, Parsha's, 709, Parsha's Bechukosa. It begins, if you will follow my decrees and observe my commandments, perform them, then I will provide your rain from their time and the land will give its produce. The tree of the field will give its fruit. And it continues with these great things that will happen if we follow the Torah. And then afterwards, on page 711, verse 14, it says, if you will not listen to me, and will not perform all, all these commandments, if you consider my decrees loathsome, and if you're being rejects my ordinances so as not to perform all my commandments, so that you will know my covenant, covenant and I will do the same to you, I will sign upon your panic, swelling, leash, and the burning fever, and terrible things that will happen if we do not fulfill the commandments. And um, just to, I just want to go back to the beginning. It says, if you'll follow my decrees, observe my commandments, and perform them, in verse 3, at the beginning of the parsha. So um, three things here, there. Follow my decrees, observe my commandments, perform them. So what is follow my decrees, if not observe my commandments and perform them? I say to say that means that we work hard, we toil in the study of Torah. And I've spoken about this in the past, that the Torah, when, with Torah, it's not the amount that we understand that counts. It's not the, um, it's not how much we delve, we manage to delve into the depths and how deep we understand. The importance is the toil that we, the work that we put in, whereas by other things, we're rewarded for, um, by other things, especially in the world, in the physical world, that we're rewarded for the value that we provide for the, the results, when, when it comes to the Torah, we're not rewarded for the results that we attain, we're rewarded for the work that we put in. And that's the, you follow my decrees means we toil in the Torah. And then it can, can, continues, we observe my commandments. The play after says that the Hebrew for that literally means tishmu, you, we guard my commandments. That means we do, we do not violate the prohibitions of the Torah. And then perform them, means that we uh, observe the positive commandments, the commandments thou shalt do the following rather than thou shalt not. So and here we have the mitzvahs to study the Torah, toil and toil in the study of Torah, don't violate prohibitions and follow the positive commandments. So in verse four, then I'll provide your means in their time, the land will give its produce, etc. 
In verse 6, I'll provide peace in the land. You'll die, lie down with none to frighten you. And in, where is it? Um, you will eat very old grain, remove the old to make way for the new. I will place my sanctuary, sanctuary among you, and my spirit will not reject you. So um, the Kleyakra says that there are three really blessings corresponding to the three different ways, three different ways we observe the Torah. That first, as a reward for toiling in the study of Torah, it says, um, I will provide your rains in their time, the land will give its produce. That the Torah is compared to water, the Torah especially is compared to rain. That the same way that God um, kind of sends down the Torah understanding and Torah, the inspiration to understand the Torah to us, like drops from the sky, as is alluded in Parshas Hazinu, that our sages interpret the discussion about the, the rain coming down to us as the um, Hashem sending down understanding of the Torah. So as a reward of our toil in Torah, Hashem sends us the rain in the proper time. We have the proper rain to be prosperous. So that's the first set of blessings. Then in verse 6, I'll provide peace in the land. You'll lie down with none to frighten you. That's a reward for, um, for not violating the prohibitions that by not violating the prohibitions, we have peace in the land and bad things don't happen to us. That's lack of, that's uh, kind of bad things not happening rather than positive good things do happen. Then in verse 10, um, verse really 11, I'll place my sanctuary among you and my spirit will not reject you. I'll walk, walk amongst you, I'll be a God unto you. That's by observing the positive commandments. So we're raising our holiness by actively fulfilling the will of Hashem, and as a reward, God joins us and God graces us with his presence amongst us. Okay, and like I said, following this, it gives a terrible things that will happen if we do not follow the Torah. And um, <clears throat> over and over it says, if you'll behave casually with me. Um, where is it? So uh, just an illustration in verse 21, if you behave casually with me on page 713 and refuse to heed me, then I shall lay a further blow upon you seven ways of like your sins. Verse 23, um, if, if despite those you will be chastised towards me and you behave casually with me. Verse 27, if despite this you will not heed me and you will behave towards me with casualness. And um, so over and over it says, the, the main sin that we're doing is behaving casually towards God. What does that mean that we're behaving casually? This is the source of all the problems that we're behaving casually towards God. So the commentaries interpret this means that um, we may be fulfilling the mitzvahs, but we're fulfilling them out of convenience, not out of a sense of, ob of obligation. That means that, oh, I, you know, I happen to be um, free the Shabbos, so I'll sit down to a Shabbos meal and I'll, I'm not, I'm not observed. So basically when it's convenient and when we feel like keeping the mitzvah, we'll keep the mitzvah, but because we feel like it, not because it's something that we have to do, not because this is what, this is the will of God, this is what I have to do, therefore I'm doing it no matter what, and we'll have to find a way, but if we don't find a way, I still can't, buy it. I can, still can't violate it. But if someone fulfills the mitzvah out of casualness, that means that they're doing it because of convenience, not because and because that's how they feel at the moment, not because of obligation, that the Torah is saying is perhaps even more destructive than just not following. And <coughs> in fact, it states in verse 40, page 715, it says, after all these things that will happen, all these awful things that will happen, it says, then they will confess their sin and the sin of their forefathers for the treachery which they betrayed towards me, and also for having behaved towards me with casualness, I too will behave towards them with cash and listen, I will bring them in the land of their enemies. Perhaps then their unfeeling hearts will be humbled, then they will gain, gain appeasement for their sin. And our sages, all the commentaries ask, it just said they will confess their sin and the sin of their forefathers for the treachery which they betrayed me, also for having betrayed towards me with casualness. Why following that confession? It seems they're, they're repenting. Why only, why after that is Hashem saying, I will also punish them more? They have just confessed their sins, they recognize what they did wrong. And um, someone answers, I don't remember where I saw this, that um, the problem here is that they're confessing the wrong thing. It says that they're confessing their sin and also that they behave towards, that they behave towards me with casualness, meaning that they took the mitzvahs lightly and only did them out of convenience. 
And, every, and that's a backwards. They're looking at everything backwards. They think the problem is the sins that they did and their mindset is secondary. But that's backwards. Their mindset is the problem and the sins are secondary, meaning the mindset that, you know, I'll do, I'll, I'll do the mitzvahs when it's convenient. I'll do the mitzvahs when I'm feeling like it. And if I don't feel like it, I won't do it. That's the bigger problem. And the fact that they violated is just, a, um, is just an effect of that. So by them confessing the sin and just secondary, yeah, my mindset was also wrong. Hashem's demonstrating you're not ready yet. If, you don't rec- if they don't recognize that they're not ready yet, and they're still punished. But the parsha ends with a comfort on page 717 and verse 42. After this tshuva, after we repent, um, I will remember my covenant with Yaakov, also my covenant with Yitzchak, and also my covenant with Avram. I will remember, I will remember the land. The land will be bereft of them, and it will be appeased for sabbaticals having become desolate of them. And this is another, another illustration of that by not follow, following the mistress of the sabbatical year, that will cause us to be, um, to be vomited from the land. And they must gain appeasement for their iniquity because they were revolted by my ordinances, because their spirit rejected by my decrees. But despite all this, while they'll be in the land of their enemies, they'll not have been revolted by them, nor will I have rejected them to obliterate them, to know my covenant with them. For I am Hashem their God. After the first covenant, in a sense, was broken, now Hashem's telling us that this new covenant has a built-in out, in a sense. That whereas the first covenant, the first tablets were expected to be perfect. We, we got it in a sense of perfection. The Jewish people were perfect at that moment that we received the first set of tablets. And when we sinned with the golden calf, so that covenant was broken. We lost it. Whereas with the second tablets, it was given in a time of tshuva, in a time of repentance. We had sinned. We repented from our sins. And through that, we received the second covenant. So the second covenant has this idea of repentance built in. And here it's saying, in spite of the sin, I will not obliterate them. And the covenant still stands because built into the covenant is a clause of tshuva, is the clause of repentance that we could always come back. And I remember them for, the, for them, the covenant of the ancients, those whom I have taken out of the land of Egypt before the eyes of the nations to be gotten to them, I am Hashem. And in verse 46, these are the decrees, the ordinances and the teachings that Hashem gave between us himself and the children of Israel at Mount Sinai through Moshe and as the Ramban speaks out that this is um, just a summary that these are all the oaths to um, the oaths to the acceptance of that second covenant of the what we the covenant the treaty the agreement between us, Hashem, us and Hashem with the acceptance and the giving of the second set of tablets. Let's see.